born in La Mesa, California. I was born at La Mesa Community Hospital. I mean, this was all a canyon, and the only building here was the restaurant. And the restaurant was a place that an electrical company had a, had a um, office there. And so he started developing this. He started a little business, and I was about seven or eight years old. And he had the little building, and he made a little market out of it. And what he did was he sold um, day-old bread. He would flag down at a watermelon truck, um, the company that brought him in eggs by the tray. And he would go ahead and, and sell them. And this was only on the weekends because he had a real job working for International Harvester. That was his mainstay, is to work in the airplane factories after he got out of the service. But it was cute because we'd get a tray of eggs and you found a couple crack ones, you'd get a mason jar and crack them and put them in the jar and put them in the refrigerator and sell them for pre-cracked eggs. So nothing ever went to waste. You know, he would, um, the bread would be two days old or three days old and people still bought it, you know, because it wasn't bad bread, it was just a little older. And so he did that. He would flag down a meat truck, I remember one time, and traded him some stuff for some meat and all. And, but it was just the thing he did on the weekends and then after work and stuff. And so I would come down here and help him and, and watch what he did. And in the meantime, back at the home, my mom would do things like she would sew aprons. She would go to yardage places, get scrap yardage, and make these aprons. And I would go door to door selling aprons. Well, I also had a garden in the backyard I had, when I was about six or seven. And so what I would do is I would grow succulents and put them in tin cans and milk containers and all because there was no plastic pots back then. And I would go door to door selling them too. And so for every dollar apron I sold, I would get a quarter and then I would get 10, 15 cents for each succulent I sold. And I finally realized as a kid that people buy stuff from kids because they feel, they feel a warmth to help a kid out. You know? And that's kind of how my entrepreneurship got started. You know, I really, I, I was never, I was given an allowance like 25, 50 cents a week for emptying the trash and doing those type of things. Uh, but coming down with my dad, my, I just wanted to be with him, you know. And, uh, and then one of my dad's hobbies was woodworking. He uh, was a violin maker. So anyway, so my dad uh, wanted me to play the violin, and I said, fine. So I started playing when I was in uh, kindergarten and all, and I played the violin up through junior high. Uh, my parents were really great parents. Um, they... My dad worked hard. Uh, he taught me the most important thing to do is to put roof over the head and food for your family and make sure they're happy. And that was the most important thing in life. And he did that. He wasn't much of a kid person, but he wasn't, he didn't ignore me. I just did things that he did instead of doing things a lot of other kids did. I think I went fishing twice with my dad in my lifetime and all. And, uh, but coming down here and seeing that he had a big wad of money all the time, you know, it just kind of sat in the back of my head and all. And so I, um, and then my mom cooked all the time and I was always be amazed at how she could put food together and make meals and all. So I watched them all the time and helped them and all. And um, having the garden in the backyard really made me feel good and my dad had one too. But the one thing my dad didn't do was my dad never complimented. He always corrected. And that was a little bit of a thing that my sister took a little hard because uh, it is tough when your dad doesn't compliment you. And it was just the way he was brought up. And so he didn't know any better. Um, but I remember my mom, when, when we would harvest vegetables out of his garden and my garden, my mom would tell me how much better my vegetables tasted than my dad's. When I was growing up, my dad gardened, he played the violin, he would work, and my mom cooked. So that kind of contributed to my lifestyle. Those are my three hobbies. As you can see, I have a big kitchen, so I cook. Uh, I dehydrate, I, I prepare a lot of food. Um, I built some of the stuff in the house here because I love woodworking. And of course I garden, you know, and that planted the seed in my mind that this is something I wanted in my life and all. So as I grew up, um, I had some classes in junior high. They had woodworking and metal shop and electric shop. The things that they don't incorporate in our lives, now, in the kids' lives now, yet became very useful for being self-sustaining because I can fix things. I, I did a lot of things myself and all. And so went to junior high school. And then when I get into high school, um, I, I grew up as a nerd. Now, back in my day, nerds were picked on. But I felt sorry for the other kids that were picked on, so I hung around with them because I just felt sorry for them. And they were nice kids. They were smart. They were, you know, really nice kids. And so being a nerd, um, you, get, you get 
people calling you names and things like that. But then you hung around the people that you really liked. And one thing I never got into was sports. And the reason I didn't was because I was never competitive. And not being competitive, you always get picked last on the team because I got to pick you. And so sports never became a part of my life. But the other things in my life grew because woodworking is solitary. And so you're able to create things and work on your own. And cooking was, was something special because I know that when my mom cooked, it brought warmth to us when we had dinner together. So it, when you make something, you're, you're making people feel good. And I think a lot of my life is bent around bringing people and having them feel good about things and all. So in high school was a turning point in my life. Um, I quit playing the violin before I went into high school because I never felt I was good enough because of the way my dad treated me. And, you know, and it's just what he was. You know, I never got mad. I just said, Dad, I'm not playing the violin anymore. And, but I did take some courses then. And one of the courses I took was, um, it was called, it was an ROP course, and it was a landscape propagation class. And one of the other courses I took was a business class. Taught you how to do checkbook, how to balance a ledger, you know, all that type of stuff that we didn't have computers to do at the time. And it was really interesting because I really clinged on to those things. You know, English was a problem for me. I couldn't understand it, you know, and that type of thing. But geometry was great. So I had a friend of mine that got me a job when I was 15 and a half working at SeaWorld. And so I went and worked at SeaWorld. I was a busboy in a place called the Hawaiian Punch Pavilion. And busboy did dishes, did errands, you know, brought food down to the place and all. And I really liked my job because you would go out when the waitresses were wait, waiting on cust, uh, customers to clean a table and somebody needed something. So you'd help the waitress out. You'd go get something for them and, and all that. So it was really joyful. But the bosses were lazy. It was like they enjoyed telling you what to do, but they, you'd see them never do anything themselves. My immediate boss was different, but the bigger bosses were. So this job I had for about four or five months, and I would work overtime and, and all that because you got paid for it and parties that they had. But that was I was able to get a car because I had to get down there. Because from Claremont to SeaWorld is a two-hour bus ride each way. So I talked to my parents and let me buy my first car. It was a Dodge Dart. I spent 500 bucks on it. Once I got a car and I was going to school, I met a lot of friends. Because gals needed rides home, friends needed rides places. So, so we were friends, but it was people I could help at all. So one day, I decided that I had enough of it. My boss at SeaWorld had gone out to the patio area and there was a pile of trash about as big as a handful. And this is vivid in my mind. I remember seeing him look at it, come up to me in the kitchen when I had a sink full of dishes and say, Bill, before you leave, go pick that pile of trash up out on the patio. I said, you bet I will. I went in and I picked it up and I took it into my media boss's and put it on her desk and said, hi, this is my two week notice. She goes, what's up? And I explained it. I said, it shouldn't be treated like this. I know I'm a kid. And yes, I got to wear a clean cut and all this kind of stuff, but bosses should be treating you as an example, not bossing you. So when I quit there, I went to Madison and I was going to school and all, and I sat and ate with my teachers and I told my two teachers, my, ag, my horticulture teacher and my, my business teacher, I said, you know, I just quit my job and I don't know what I want to do. And they thought for a minute, they turned to me, why don't you just open up a plant nursery? I said, wow, I could do that. So I'm thinking about it. I go home. I talk to my dad. I said, Dad, I'd like to open up a plant nursery down on the property. And he said, OK. And I had 200 bucks saved up. So the only piece of property besides the restaurant building that was here was this little piece of property that the double story building was on, just a small little piece of property. Had a little fence in front of it. And so I asked him if I could use this to start my business. So he said I could use it. So I went and I, I, I came down here and I looked at gee, what I could carry and what I could do. So I ended up getting a pile of manure from one of the dairies because he had always done it. I ended up getting a pile of wood shavings from a nursery that got flooded in Mission Valley. That It did work out. There was a trucking company next door to me. They didn't know where to get rid of this stuff. So they dropped it off for me. And then there was a truck driving by with a load of sand that they had excavated. So they dumped it here. So I had the beginnings of soil. So I also went back that year to my horticulture class and dug every plant up out of our gardens that we created because most of the kids were there to get out of class and smoke pot and the teacher didn't have a clue or whatever. So they weren't into it, but I was. 
And then I took out all the plants at my house I could and put them in milk cartons and tin cans. And then what I would do is go to other nurseries when they were closed and go in their trash cans and pull plants out they were throwing out. So that was my first inventory. And when my dad was selling fertilizer and firewood, he would go ahead and bag the fertilizer. So I learned that from, there was a place up the street called Balboa Bakery, and they would get all this flour in paper bags and throw all the bags out. So I'd go in their dumpster and dig out all the paper bags, bring them down here and fill them up with the, the manure or a soil mix I made, but it was mostly manure because it was light and all. And I would sell them three for a dollar and a nickel. And tax was five cents back then, five, five percent, so it was five cents for tax. And my first dollar and dime I ever took, I saved or took in. It's over there and it's a dollar ten cents. It was from three bags of manure that I had bagged and all. So that was kind of the beginnings of the nursery. I was still going to school full time, so I only run the nursery Saturdays and Sundays. And actually, I have a ledger here that my mom kept of all my sales. You know, I've sold this for $1.20. I went and bought this for 50 cents, whatever. She kept a ledger for me uh, back when I first started because one of my toughest things in life was keeping books and book work. I just, I, mean, I still don't like doing it, but I do it, you know. Um, so basically, that land led on until I graduated high school. And then I thought, well, I love horticulture, but I couldn't go to a four year college because. I lived here and had a business and all. So I ended up going to Mesa College in the evening. Uh, at that time in my life, when I turned 18, two things happened. Number one, I decided I didn't want to live in the house anymore with my parents. So I asked my mom and dad if I could move down to the to place down here and they said, well, what are you gonna live in? So for $500, I bought a trailer. It's a tra camping trailer. And I hooked a hose and, a, and a, an electrical cord up to it. And so living down here meant I didn't have to travel all the time. You know, and it was nice to be here and, and all that. And the second thing, since you move out of the house, you need to do things. So as part of my degree, I ended up taking badminton at school because I wasn't competitive and it was fun. But I got to get a shower every night because I didn't have a shower in this little trailer. You know. And so that's kind of when I moved down here to be here. Um, and stepping back a little bit, uh, when I first opened the nursery, one of the things I also thought would be cool would be to sell baby chickens for Easter. So I went and I bought 100 baby chickens two weeks before Easter. And it turned out that by the time Easter came around, they had feathers and nobody bought them. So I got stuck with this 100 chickens. So what did I do? I took them back home to Claremont. This was when I was about 16, 17. And we raised them in the backyard of my parents' house. And the neighbors I went to and I said, just hang in there because we're gonna be getting eggs. So once we started getting eggs, I went to all the neighbors in the neighborhood and said, if you want eggs, come and take them, but leave something in return. So they would pick up a dozen eggs and leave a pie or, or oranges from, their, from their, their trees or something. So it was kind of a way that happened, but when I moved out of the house, I brought all my chickens with me, which numbered about 20 or 30 at the time. The flock shrank after a period of time. And so thus, I was here, I had eggs, and I was pretty close to being self-sustaining. Uh, one of the trades that my dad did when he owned his, his market was he traded some firewood for a case of Betty Crocker instant mashed potatoes. They were in cans, it was this huge case. So as a housewarming present, my parents gave me this half a case of instant mashed potatoes. So between eggs, mashed potatoes, and ketchup, I pretty much had food. So I took four years of college and I graduated my AS degree. And that's about the formal education I've had in life. But all of all these mentors, a lot of them were very friendly. I found out in the nursery industry that it's not really competitive, it's more supportive nurseries. And I know in the history of my nursery, I've talked to other nursery owners and they've made suggestions and it's worked. You know, it's like one of my teachers told me in business that there's two ways of doing business. You can make a little on a lot or a lot on a little. And that's just the way business is. Uh, I met her at, at Mesa College and we dated for a while and got married and that was, uh, that was a really great part of my life because I, had n I was a nerd, I had no social life. And that's why I had a business and it worked out fine. And, uh, 
So we got married um, about five years after we dated, and she was working for an advertising agency, and she hated her job. So at that time, I said, you know, if you quit your job and came work with me for a year and tried it, and if it would work, great, and if not, go find something else. Well, she ended up uh, being my partner for 20 years. Uh, we grew the business together, um, and we had our kids down here and stuff like that. So, and it's a lot of history with a lot of details we can talk about, but uh, so that's kind of how Mesa College became part of my life, is giving me that opportunity. I went into a couple of partnerships in life uh, when I was younger, just because they had great ideas and I didn't know anything. I have no business experience. I've had no, no restaurant owning experience. You know, I just kind of did it as I, I went. And one of the partnerships was good for a while until he taught me how to go buy product from other people instead of trying to grow it and make it myself. And so, and that partnership lasted for about two or three years and, and it ended and I ended up buying him out. Um, and how I bought him out was when I was young, I got a, um, I got a bunch of uh, savings bonds. And also in school, when I was a kid, you could take and buy 10 cent savings stamps you got enough, you could buy a savings bond. And so I would take my lunch money that my mom gave me for lunches sometimes at school and I would buy savings stamps with them and then come home hungry as heck. She couldn't figure it out, but I ended up getting some savings bonds that way. So I took all those savings bonds to buy myself out of my first partnership. You know? and, but that taught me. So I was able to start contacting companies and start buying product in. But for the most part, I always had my own soil mix, always bagged my own manure um, and to this day, it's kind of something that I still do. I, I enjoy being unique and different, and this has given me the opportunity and all the time I've been running this to do that and all. So, um, anyways, we were, uh, we dated for about five years, and we got married, and she just started to start working here, which gave me the opportunity to expand the business a little bit. So at that time, I went and got a contractor's license, because when I owned the nursery, I would only be open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'd mow lawns. So I did it when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I delivered papers, I sold my mom's aprons, I mowed lawns, whatever it took to make money, you know? And I was very, very cautious of what I spent stuff on. When I turned 18, my dad actually told me, because he wasn't complimentary, I should get a real job. So this is one time in our life that I kind of butted heads with him. And I said, but dad, I really want to go ahead and own my own business. You can see that I have this little thing going on. And my mom kept saying, just let him do it. And my dad kept saying, no, we should get a real job working at the airplane factories. You'll have pension, you'll have health insurance, you'll have all this stuff, and you'll make money. So finally he gave in, but he told me, he says, there's nothing for free in the world. So in 1974, when I graduated school, he started charging me rent. Nothing for free. As the business grew, so did the rent grow. You know, but you know he's right. You know you you you, you got to make your ends meet. You got you know helping hands are fine, but this seriously is. If he didn't own part of this property, then I wouldn't have a place to start it. The other thing he taught me when I turned 18 was never put money in the bank. Always buy property. So when I was about 19 years old, the property this house sits on became available for sale, but it was landlocked by my dad's property because he owned the frontage. So I bought it for $5,000. I borrowed the money, f I had the, the guy that owned the property carried the paper, so I basically had to pay him. I borrowed some of the money from my aunt, and the rest of it I paid myself until I paid her off, and that was $75 a month, and I barely made payments. But it was unusual, usable. It was a canyon and a hill. So it kind of sat that way. Occasionally in the evenings I had nothing better to do, I'd take a wheelbarrow and shovel and dig some of the hill out and throw it in the canyon. And, all. and I did that for a while, um, there was a lot of things that I did that I can't believe that I did back then. I had the energy for it. Like when we started selling soil, I decided I needed to get something to carry it in, so I bought a trailer. So I shoveled the soil into the back of the trailer, delivered it, and shoveled it out of the trailer. And it was about $8 a yard delivered. $5 for the soil and $3 for the delivery. <laughs> but that's grown another part of my business because not, when I started getting soil, I started making my own mixes. I would add this to it and that to it and start creating a mix that I thought was pretty good because I would use it in my potting to pot my plants with and all. As the nursery started, I decided that it should be organically run because it cost too much to, 
to buy chemicals and you had to register stuff. So I've always kept it that way, but it's always evolved. I went from, from just buying soils to start buying plants, to start bringing an inventory in. Uh, when we got married, I finally had a partner, uh, which helped out. Um, as the kids uh, were born, my three children were born down here, and every time we'd have a birth, we'd put a sign on the marquee, you know, it's a boy, it's a girl. And they were all raised in the nursery, and they were all raised behind a counter in a playpen to begin with. And people would come and see them. And to this day, I have customers coming and say, I remember when your little boy was behind a counter in a playpen, you know. So it was, it's pretty cool that they were raised here, which planted the seed in their mind, you know. And as they got older, they worked here after school um, uh, to put food on the table. We'd have them, we'd be planting strawberries together or doing things, you know, planting plants and stuff like that, or even helping customers. So they grew up in the nursery doing things. Um, and then as time went on, I decided that I needed to have evolution to the nursery. I needed to look at different things. And, and I got excited about stuff. And the one thing that I've learned when you get excited about something is that the only way it's going to succeed is if you don't have a negative. You know, a negative can happen later, but in the beginning, if you get a negative, it's going to set you back. So up in the 90s, um, when the nursery was doing well, actually stepping back, in the 80s, um, my parents became ill. And so we, I moved my parents down here to the bottom floor of the building in front and created a, 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 an apartment for them so they could live down here and we could watch them and take care of them. And my kids saw me and my former wife taking care of my parents so that it instilled in them to, hey, this is something you do. It's not something that's a choice, even though you should choose to because you have good parents. But we took care of my parents. Uh, my mom passed away about, let's see, it was about 1980, 1995, maybe 94. My mom passed away first. And it was tough, but my dad was still alive. And so we took care of him for the, for the years that he lived and all. And it was interesting because when I had my third child, which was before that, first time my dad ever complimented me. And my dad turned to me one day, he goes, you know, Bill, I'm proud of you. You know, you're running a business, you have three, gave me three great grandkids and all. And he says, I really wish I would have started a business of my own. And he loved food. And he had built, back in the 80s, he had built a um, two-story building as a drive through restaurant, but never got a chance to do it. You know. So that kind of led me to the point in the, uh, where you know, it kept in my mind, my dad loves food, but never had a restaurant. So as we evolved um, in the 90s, I looked at the hydroponic industry and I said, this is really interesting. What brought me onto that was people would come in and ask for uh, rock wool and cloning gels. And I didn't have a clue. So I started looking into it. And I said, you know, this sounds like it's a pretty interesting thing. I think I'll go ahead and, and learn some about it. So I talked to a couple companies. I went up to visit the companies and explain what products and all sell and how to do it. So I basically learned how to do hydroponics. And so we started bringing stuff in. And I tell you, that was an eye opener. I was the only hydroponic store in San Diego for a long time. And that was crazy business. Um, but I kept the rule of thumb is I don't know what you wanted to grow. And I always had the nursery as my first. Every time I've added something to the nursery, it's always been to bring people into the nursery. It's very important that you have that philosophy no matter where you go with the business. But it all needs to be business related. So in the later 90s, people started wanting to open their own hydroponic stores. And the reason being is a lot of the hydroponic stores were a store that they could buy wholesale to grow whatever they were doing on the backyard type of thing. So I started looking at it going, you know, I think it's time to back out of that and start doing something else. So in the meantime, in 19, uh, 1999, I was talking to my dad. He said, Bill, I really, really, really wanted a restaurant. Now, he had Parkinson's at the time. I said, Dad, we can do this. So where the restaurant is now was a taco shop. But it was interesting, when I was 18, when I was 17, it was a bar. Been a bar for years, it was called Crawford's Maverick Club. And it was a bar probably from when I was about 15, you know, until then. And I was able to finally drink when I turned 21. 
but when I when I turned 21, um, it closed and a Mexican restaurant opened up. So in 1999, it was up for sale. It had a C rating in the window. The guy wanted to sell it to his employees. I said, uh-uh. So I went up to my dad. I said, Dad, how would you like to own a restaurant? He goes, that would be great. So we bought the business. We gutted the place. It was greasy, filthy, raw. And we created a restaurant. Now, the only experience I've ever had in a restaurant industry was being a busboy at the Hawaiian Punch Pavilion. But I didn't have a negative. So him and I would start visiting different restaurants, especially delis, start tasting their food, seeing how they operate it. They weren't too friendly with if you told me you were opening a restaurant. So what I would do is when the family went in to eat, I would go and go in their dumpster and write down bag label names and where they got their product from and start contacting those people. You know. There was a Mexican restaurant down the street. And when I told the gentleman I was going to be opening a restaurant, a deli, he goes, what can I do for you? There's no, nothing but Mexican food in this part of town. So he helped me out. His name was Gabe. on Chiquitas down the street. And so he gave me some books. And basically, I had been to New York a lot because I had relatives there. And I saw what delis were like. And I got a concept of what I really wanted to have. So we, we worked on this. Well, another lesson taught. We were going to open it up for my dad's 86th birthday. And he passed away five weeks before we opened it. So I turned to the family. I said, we got a restaurant and a nursery, what do you guys want to do? And they said, let's keep the restaurant. So we opened it up, um, and it was fun. You know, owning the building made it fun. My kids worked there and at the nursery, and I did both. We all kind of did each and every. We did some catering, which was really cool, and they enjoyed it. Um, and it became just part of our life. My accountant, on the other hand, told me that it was losing $13,000 a year, and I should do something about it. And I turned to him, I said, but the nursery's supporting it. He goes, yeah. I said, well, I don't want to get rid of it. I want to keep it. So the interesting part about that part of my life was in, uh, when my dad died in 1999, uh, my sister and I went through his stuff. And I made sure everything was equal between the two of us. She has no kids. I said, Dad, it's everything down the middle. And so he did. He set up a trust with everything down the middle, which was fine. But there was one bank account that he hadn't told us about. And it was all the rent money he collected from 1978 to 1999. And that's how this house got built. You know, it was something that my mother-in-law was interesting. My mother-in-law always said, when are you going to give my daughter a real house, you know, because we live in a trailer? And I said, someday I will. Not having a negative, I said, someday I will. So after my dad passed, we decided to build this house. And it was the cutest thing, though, because at the time when I got a tractor, which was in 1985, I would take that tractor, and every night and day I would be pushing a little dirt in the canyon, which created a flat pad, which when we got married in, 80, in 1980, about 1982, I was able to put a mobile home back here. So actually it was in the 70s that I got this tractor. And all. So anyway, so we were able to build a, put a mobile home back here. And that was the time we could go down, they gave you information, you drew your own plans, and you put a mobile home in. You, drew, you put your water in, your sewer, and I can't believe, but I did all that stuff. You know, I dug trenches. I dug a trench down the back canyon, 12 feet below the surface of the canyon, you hook into the sewer. No shoring, just squeezed down in there and hooked it up and came back out and lived through it. Didn't get crushed or buried. Um, laid my own brick. And this was what's really neat about when I went to school, high school, they taught me these things. You learned how to do these things. In, in the nursery landscape technology, they taught you how to lay brick. You know, In math, I had a technical math. They taught you how to do slopes, how to figure board feet, how to figure how many bricks to build a wall. This was really cool stuff that I gained knowledge from. And I, I latched onto this because I thought it was useful. The only math I thought that was useful, and I still use it today, is geometry. The rest of it, I finally found out from my teachers, they gave you this math to think outside the box. You know, algebra is to think outside the box, to think ahead of things, to figure out equations. So anyway, so we um, went and, and had a pad cut. We went and got um, permits, which went fairly easily. I would say it was easier back then. Um, I decided to be my own contractor. And it was cute because the kids would then go out and they would take their Legos and build a model of the house, what it would look like. So before we started construction, I chalked out the house on the flat piece of ground that I have. And so they got to see where their bedrooms are going to be and stuff like that. 
This was all just part of living at the nursery and living at work. They were able to see that kind of stuff. And so we ended up um, um, building a house with it. Uh, we had a restaurant. Uh, we had a nursery. We had three teenage kids. And I finally realized that two out of those five things are things that cause divorces. <laughs> Owning a restaurant and building a house. <laughs> So the marriage ended uh, just probably after we finished building the house and all. Um, crazy times, whatever it was. Um, she's still a friend of mine. She actually, she got a job working in another nursery and she's been there ever since. Um, they've, she's enjoyed her work up until she found out that it's kind of like a number on a, on a kind of time card and you know, it, 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 there's no pride of ownership in working for somebody, especially a corporate nursery. So in the meantime, um, I was, basically raising these three teenage kids, finishing off the house, having a nursery, and running a restaurant. So six years later, after we opened it, my kids came to me and they wanted to talk to me, but they wanted a mediator. So we had a couple friends come over and I said, what's up? Well, I'm a sentimentalist. And they approached me and they said, Dad, you're doing too much. You're raising us, you're running a nursery, building a house and a restaurant, you gotta get rid of something. Please don't get rid of us. You're also kidding, kidding kids. So I said, okay, I'll just, I'll close the restaurant. But they were afraid I was gonna get too sentimental over it and wanna keep it, you know. So, but I looked at it and I had three, four good employees. I said, what am I gonna do with these people if I close the restaurant? So I decided, I turned to the cook and I said, I tell you, I got a deal, but you can't say anything until I'm done. I'm gonna give you this business. And it was running okay. It was, like I said, I was losing $13,000 a year, but it was running okay. You know, I had my clientele. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, but you got to listen to me. You got to get everything out of my name. You've got six months before you have to pay rent. You got to pay me for product and maintain everything else. He goes, and? And I said, I'll charge you 3% of your gross and I get to eat for free. Now that's not a lot of money, but the idea was to keep the restaurant going and keep the people employed. And I knew someday this restaurant would be greater than I could do it because I, was, I had too much on my plate. So he kept it for six years. And at six years, he turned to me, he says, here's the key, I quit. And he walked. So I'm sitting there going, now with a big thriving business and grown kids, I'm sitting there going, wow, I get to have a restaurant back. And my employees and my kids said, no, <laughs> you can't. And I said, but why? He goes, because you're crazy, and it's going to be more than you can handle. you got enough on your plate. I said, okay. A lot of times your kids will see you from the outside and just make you realize things, and they were right. So we had 14 people make an offer on the restaurant. Most of them were established businesses. Actually, all of them were established businesses wanting a second place to have a, another restaurant. And there was a, this one guy that never had a business in his life. So my daughter and son and I and daughter sat down and we said, what should we do here? And they said, let's give it to the person that's never owned a business in their life. So we approached him, I said, okay, we'll let you have this. We'll negotiate the rent and all that, but you don't have to pay rent until you open your doors. But you gotta get everything out of my name. I don't wanna pay for anything. I don't want it to be a burden on me. So they took a year and a half to open, but they finally did. And what's nice about all my tenants that have had the nursery, I mean the restaurant, is that it became, it was started at Nate's Deli, it became Nate's Cafe, and now it's Nate's Garden Grill, so it still has my dad's name in it. That's the sentiment part, sentimentality part that I really enjoy. You could pull up the front rug at the entrance to the restaurant, and it'll say Nate's Deli, Nate's Deli at City Farmers, which is the original. And I still have the original dollar that I took in on a cup of coffee when I opened it. And, uh, but you know, it's interesting about owning a business is that I believe there's five things you need to know in order to be successful. Number one is you gotta eat it, breathe it, drink it, and sleep with it, and I've done that. But then again, people say, well, how can you, how can you live on a place that you do business? It's because it's not a business, it's my life. I'm not a workaholic, I just love what I do. And if you love what I do, and you do, it'll be great. So, so yeah. So when you the five things is you gotta you gotta love it. You gotta eat it, breathe it, drink it, sleep with it. The second thing is is you have to have a good story. And when you go through this video and, and look at it, it's really got a good story because 
it's a true story of things that happened in my life, the blessings that I've, that I've gone through in my life. The next thing is you have to have a good shtick. You have to have something that everybody does, but you do better, or something nobody does, and you do it. And you might not be the only that does it. People might follow in your footsteps, but it was your beginning. You're the one that started it. And if you look at our website, you'll see the story and the shtick that we do. The next thing is, is that you have to evolve. And over the period of business, it has evolved. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Rebecca, and I have a disease that's called a brain won't stop. You know, And it's not as though I've had to grow the business. It's grown on its own through what we've done here. But new ideas really get exciting to me. You know, I remember back in uh, early 2000s, maybe, um, somebody wanted to uh, start up a beekeeping meetup group. I said, this is cool. We need bees for gardens. So I went and we started this whole meetup group. And the process, I'm thinking, where do you get your beekeeping supplies from? Well, there's a couple places here. We get them online. I said, got to have beekeeping supplies. So I went to all these professional beekeepers. And I said, what do you guys need? to keep bees because I'm just learning about it right now. And they told me I bought all this stuff in from a wholesaler and we started carrying beekeeping supplies. At one time I thought, you know, people harvest things but they have nothing to put them in. So I started carrying canning goods. I remember one of my employees saying, who's gonna buy these things? I said, people will buy them. They need to store what they grow. And sure enough, they buy them not only to store things they can and all that, but they put nuts and bolts in them. They buy all this canning stuff. And so it's cool because it was a new idea that just took off. And, all. and so the concept of, of evolution has always been on our minds, you know, and, and the fact is now that I look at things is that I've owned the business for so long that I'm starting to lose suppliers. A few things that are happening in an industry. Number one is they mainstream. They don't carry what you usually carry because they're mainstreaming for larger businesses. Uh, second is that uh, they want to retire and the kids don't want to take over, so they end up shutting down. Uh, third thing is, is that the property becomes too valuable, so they end up selling it. Or fourth thing is they get tired and they want to go ahead and maybe open up something else. So you deal with these things, so you end up losing the suppliers, the diversity of your suppliers. And so we decided to start doing things on our own. So many years ago, I, with making my soil mixes I always made, we started improving on that and we've always had a good soil mix. That's one of our, 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 our own products. We just, I decided to make a potting soil. It took me four years to make a potting soil to work it out. Why? Because I carry some great potting soils, but eventually, who knows what could happen with that company. So we now have an in-house potting soil that I sell. And you know, it's taken a while to grow. You know, the first batch I got in took almost a year to sell. But as the improvements, we found out the reason our soil wasn't doing too well, it needs to sit for a few months. So now we let each load sit for a few months. Now it's working really well and all. We decided to have a lot of people came in that wanted more than a packet of seeds. So at one time I said, you yeah, we should carry bulk seed. So I went after these old card catalog files from the libraries and we developed uh, bulk seeds, you know. And with this development also adds new and exciting things, you know. It's, it's like it should never stop, you know. So the interesting thing is that when you have lemons, you make lemonade. And all my life I've done that. You know, uh, I've, I've, I've created three kids that never wanted part of the business because they had to work here. And all of a sudden they're realizing how special of a place it is. This was in 2015. I kind of a, a mixed miracle happened in my life. I was at a friend's house, it was New Year's Eve, and every year I thank him for having this party. And he was a vegetarian and so I went over to his house New Year's Day for the party. And he had a lot of vegetarian stuff, which included a lot of beans. He had hard-boiled eggs and all this stuff. And I loved that stuff. And I ate way too much of it at his party, and I got sick. And I remember coming back to the house here, and I just, I just was sick. I, I didn't know what to do about it. I took all the remedies I knew, and it just didn't work. So went to the emergency room in the hospital. Went to the emergency room, and they forever. They finally took a photo of it and he says, you have a gas problem. I said, I know. Do something about it. So they gave me something and I got better the next day. Well, two weeks later, the doctor calls me and he says, we need to meet. I have talked to you about something. Dating back in 2011, 
they saw a spot on my liver. They were doing something back then, but they blew it off for cirrhosis. So I do have cirrhosis, but cirrhosis of the liver, which is NASH, which is non-alcoholic. When I was younger, I ate wrong. So I went into the doctor and um, he turned to me and says, you've got cancer in your liver. That's a weird feeling. That's like, my daughter was there with me and I think my fiance was there and we we're just sitting there and I was going, wow. And so he said, you know, you get to think about what you want to do, you know, recommend, you know, you know, get, get an, a, an um, a, uh, oncologist and we'll go from there and see what we can do. I said, okay. So I went home and just started thinking about things and all. And so my daughter wanted to tell the other two kids and I said, well, I'd rather you not tell Sam because he's on a trip, you know. She goes, it's not fair. You need to tell Sam. I said, okay. Well, tell him, but tell him we just found out about it and we need to do a lot of testing so he doesn't have to rush home. Well, she told my, my daughter, Sarah, who was out of town, and lives out of town, and my son, and my son decided to turn around and come home. When he went to Mexico, though, he took some gardening books because he didn't know really what I wanted to do in life. And so, um, anyway, so I found out I had it, you know, and started in with my first oncologist. They did a bunch of tests and x-rays and started doing all that stuff, and she goes, well, you know, you have um, cirrhosis of the liver. Between that, diabetes and stress, that's probably what brought this out. Um, I suggest you do a liver transplant. That way you can take the liver out, you get a new liver. You won't have cancer, you won't have cirrhosis, and a transplant will give you a new life. And so I said, okay, sounds logical. I'm a person of logic. If it sounds good and it's simple, do it. It's almost like being a fix-it person, you know. So I got home and I started thinking about it. I says, I need to look into this. This is me now, you know, I, I do study on stuff that's important, I need to look into this. So I started looking into things. I started going and thinking, well, there's gotta be stuff out there that helps your body fight cancer. You know, build up your immune system. So I went online and I Googled everything that, that, that builds up your immune system that you eat or can take, everything that fights cancer, everything that, um, alkalize your body, because these are things that I heard in Eastern medicine work. And I figured there's got to be a mix of the two. You know. So I labeled everything that I could eat that would benefit and all. So um, my son came home. He goes, Dad, I made a decision. He goes, I want to work in the nursery. And I said, I want you to think about it. He said, I thought about it. I said, don't do it because I'm not doing well. I'm going to get rid of this stuff and it's going to be fine. Don't do it. We had a long discussion about it. He goes, no. He goes, I really thought about it and I really enjoy being here and I miss it and I like the crew we have here and I want to be part of it. I said, okay, great. I'm thinking in my mind, my God. <laughs> and my oldest daughter, Rebecca, had already been part of marketing and all, but she's taken on a bigger role. My youngest daughter, Hadn't really done much. She does kind of advertising and she does uh, layout. She's an artist. So they're all three now on board. So the benefits of this whole thing is I found out early because most people don't find out about cancer until they're sick feeling. And I have to this day never felt a day sick in my life, which is, like I said, it's a blessing. But it's also a blessing that it happened because it slowed my life down a little bit. I started thinking more of things that should be done that I never did. And I'm not talking vacations, I'm talking living trusts and burial plots and all that because I'm 61 years old. You gotta start putting that stuff aside, you know. And uh, so I was able to do that. My kids came in at a really good time too because in 2015, I had a tenant in my house that left her not happy. And I think something happened where code enforcement was contacted. And so in 2015, they want to do a walk through the whole property. Now, whole philosophy was it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. I've done that all my life. Well, it was time to ask forgiveness. So we have a booklet about an inch thick of stuff that I got to deal with uh, because we didn't get permits for stuff or it's not legal to have it or whatever, you know. And unfortunately, the city is more of enforcement 
than of an information, help you out, let's get you through this, let's work with you. There's a few employees down there that, that, that head that way. For the most part, it's cookie cutter, you know. And so what we've done with that part of it is my kids have taken that over, which has taken it off my plate. The second thing is we've just, everything we've had it done, we've just turned it into lemonade. Cute example is we have these Connex boxes, they're big storage containers. I thought they were temporary things and you didn't have to get a permit. Well, you do. And not only that, but you have to get an engineer. So it gets tied down. So if the wind comes along, it doesn't get blown away. So I went through all that. And I said, you know, this is too expensive to do this. But I found out that under 120 square feet, you don't need a permit. So I hired a welder to come in and cut them all in half and put doorways on half the other half. So now I have the same boxes here, only they're smaller and I don't need permits for them. So you learn this stuff. You make the, 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 this stuff work. So the whole cancer thing, it's like, I, it's not private to me. I, it's not something that I interior hold because I always listen to people and they come up with ideas and, and I've gotten a lot of input from customers and friends and doctors and I appreciate it all. I don't feel bombarded. Um, I know there's some snake oil out there, but then again, I know that I don't trust certain things and I know there's a good marriage between the two and all. So my health has involved, evolved now. You know, I got to the point where um, they started looking for a liver for me. It was an interesting thing. They sent me to uh, New Orleans because they have um, Oshner Hospital there, which is the largest transplant center in, in, in the country because they have a lot of fatalities there. Um, they ran tests on me. They figured out that they had a question about my gallbladder, so they sent me back. So they came back here, and I was registered with uh, Scripps to get a liver transplant too uh, because uh, Kaiser didn't do that thing. So I was registered with almost two hospitals at the same time, which isn't supposed to be, but it ended up that way. So anyway, so I go and I get back and they start checking my gallbladder out. And Kaiser had thought it was gallstones, but they, so they went in to my stomach to do a checkout and they were looking around and they hadn't got the results back, but a liver became available. So the hospital calls me and they said, they got, you got 20 minutes to come down here. What do you do? Um, and we get down here, I said, I need a minute to talk to my kids. So they said, well, you don't got long, but call us back within 10 minutes. Okay. So I called my kids. We had a conference call. I says, what do I do? I got this liver here. And they go, well, what is your gut feeling to say, Dad? And I said, I don't want it. I just, what happens if the cancer's outside my liver? And I know I've asked them this, and they said, well, we have drugs. We'll be able to work you through that. And I'll, I says, I won't have an immune system when they take this liver out. I won't, my body won't be able to do nothing. So I told him, I says, I'm going to pass on this thing. So I called the doctor back. I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through with it. Pass it on to somebody that can use it. And I'm just going to wait it out and all. So she told me I was kind of crazy and that's okay. So in the meantime, I was going to liver support groups. So I went to these support groups, and I remember one support group, there's a guy that just got a liver two days previously. He was so happy he could go and get his hamburger and soda at one of the places. Now they can eat regular, and I'm sitting there going, you got a new liver, and you're putting that into it? I didn't say anything. I just thought these things. And then I had mentioned that I turned one down, and these people just thought I was crazy. But these people's back was up against the wall. They needed a liver. I was doing it to prevent things from spreading. So they got the results back from the gallbladder and they said, your gallbladder is fine, but the cancer metastasized. You have four tumors outside your liver. So I thought, wow, that was a good move. Went in to see my doctor. She goes, that was a good move. So I said, so how are we going to treat this cancer? So I'm studying now. I'm looking at alternatives. I'm looking at uh, trials. I'm looking at everything that I could come up with. And she goes, well, it's chemo and radiation. I said, well, don't you have something that's targeted? You know, I heard about tar targeted this, targeted that, and all this. And she goes, well, no. She goes, well, wait a minute. There's a guy up in Los Angeles that does targeted chemo. Let me call him. Without asking questions and challenging, they would have put me on a regular regime. So I, I went up to L.A., and this gentleman does a thing called a taste. They take a ball of chemo, they put it in your, on a catheter, and put it right at the blood vessel that's feeding the tumor, stops the blood flow, and chemo's the tumor. So the fact is, is I've had three of my 
Two of my cells in my liver were killed. One, it was too small to deal with, you know. And so I've learned that the system wants you to follow it. And that's okay, because that's their job. Sometimes they blow out of proportion a little bit, so you can get your butt together and following it. And sometimes they're right that you're waiting too long. But I walk that fine line now. Um, I've learned that I mix the two together. I think Western medicine has been fantastic for, for monitoring me. But I will recommend, I don't want a CAT scan, I want a, a MRI, because there's no radiation in MRIs. And they've done it. So you have to be your own person. You have to go out and say, this is what I want. This is what I need you to do and, and have them do it. So that's where I sit. I got this stuff in me. I plans on, I went to Mexico. I visited 10 clinics. Why did I go to Mexico? Because the clinics in Mexico do the same things almost as the clinics in Europe. And I know there's a lot of hogwash in all medical industry. But there's a couple that I went to that I really felt good about because I talked to patients there. I'm not one to sit in a waiting room without talking to them. What are you in here for? What's happening? You know, and, and I found a couple that there has been some fairly success rates. So, you know, right now I'm heading down there. Going to go to see what I can do. Come back, get an MRI done. If that doesn't work, we'll see. I just know that the, that chemo and radiation does work for some people. I've had talked to people for 15, 20 years, they had it done. That was a long time ago and they're still fine. You know, they can remove stuff and you'll still be fine. You also have to get your body in shape. You gotta cut back on things and really think, am I gonna eat this or am I gonna live longer? And just run your life that way, but not do without because there's so many other things you can do to enjoy life. Which has also taught me, which I've always thought, and my dad used to tell me, that every day is a good day, some are better than others. Now, every day is a gift. And it's been a gift even before I got cancer. I just enjoy every day, you know? And there's a thing called minusca, minutia, which is minuscule shit. People dwell on minuscule shit all the time. And I just don't, you know? So that's kind of my health issue where I'm at right now. Um, and we're planning December, my last visit to my oncologist. It's grown a little bit, hasn't spread, but grown more, and he's concerned. So he says, I want, to choose, I want to set you up for radiation and chemo. And I said, okay, because you don't have to use it. Let me just get it set up. I'd like you in here in two weeks, but, and so there, but you make up your mind. And I've talked to my kids, and they would prefer I did that in a way. They don't trust Eastern as much as I do, but I have been given time. And so I'm gonna go to Mexico, come back from Mexico, and then make that decision. In the meantime, you know, my kids are running the place, they're doing well. My son and I butted heads. When he first came in here, he was, he was gung-ho to take over and do things, and then I'm old school and he's new school. And we had a lady teach us a very, very, very important lesson. And the lesson is, there are leaders and then there are advisors in a business. When you give up something to your son, you are now an advisor, not a leader. And that seemed to work out good for us. I've given up certain things. So now he comes to me, I'm going to do this. Do you have any advice on it? A few things, we still butt heads, but that's okay because I don't want this to be a bad transaction. I want to be a good one. I went to a trade show with nursery people the other day, and I have a lot of my co-nursery owners that are thinking of selling their businesses to their kids. And I'm sitting there going, why are you selling your business to your kids? Why aren't you just giving it to them? It's a, it's a legacy you're giving them. They're going to continue it on. You know? They're going to carry it on for another generation. Well, you know that there's some finance. And I said, well, let your kids pay you or something monthly as a salary, but give it to your kids, you know? But and, 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 and that's their reasoning why. Maybe they have kids that aren't interested. But my kids have all felt that they all have a partnership in this. Who puts the most time and gets the bigger cut of the pie? And I had to make my living trust because I'm going to be dead. And afterwards, I signed it. At the end, I said, you know, if somebody disagrees with us, they get nothing. But they made it because they got together and worked on it together as a team. I don't know.